welcome to em rapid 2022 myself dr naveen mohan associate professor of emergency medicine at amrita institute of medical sciences kochi so today let us discuss regarding tricyclic antidepressant toxicity the tca toxicity before moving to the topic proper i would i would just give a brief idea regarding the classification of antidepressants here this diagram so the antidepressants are basically classified into five one is the reversible inhibitors of monoamine oxidase a the rimas then comes tricyclic antidepressants tcas then the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors ssris then the serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors snris and also the atypical antidepressants so five classes so right now i'm going to talk about the tricyclic antidepressant toxicity the ssri toxicity is all is altogether a different uh, topic so so what is a tricyclic antidepressant tcas are basically first generation of drugs used to treat, used to treat depression nowadays tcas are being replaced by ssris okay but occasionally tcas are still used to treat ocd adhd panic phobic disorders anxiety and also severe depression it's usually tcas are usually available in uh, tablet forms capsule forms solution forms and one major thing you will have to remember is that the tcas have got has got a very narrow therapeutic index it means that tca toxicity can occur even at therapeutic dosages okay i hope all of you know regarding what is therapeutic index that is toxic dose divided by effective dose okay so if you look at the molecular structure here it's a three ring molecular structure with a side chain okay tca and it has got a very long uh, uh, elimination half life tca so let's just briefly go through the pharmacokinetics of tca so once a tricyclic antidepressant is consumed let it be tablet form or solution form or a capsule form it is rapidly absorbed and nearly completely from the small intestine and the blood the peak levels in the blood will be attained by at, at around 2 to 6 hours after consumption so after consumption 90% of the tcas will bind to the protein and you should note that it is very very highly lipid soluble and it has got a very high vd around 10 to 50 liters per kg it readily crosses the blood brain barrier and you should also understand that the tissue tca levels are around 10 to 100 times greater than plasma level because of this property the hemodialysis hemoperfusion peritoneal dialysis or even forced diuresis, diuresis is futile okay then moving on to excretion tcas undergo extensive first pass metabolism in the liver it undergoes goes through various steps but the final step is basically a glucuronide acid conjugation it happens in the final step and after metabolism the tcas are excreted through the urine as well as through the bile and you should also understand that once tca is metabolized when metabolized the tca metabolite will have a pharmacological activity which is almost equal to the parent drug okay so it is, the tca will stay in your blood for quite a long quite a long time okay and it will tend to exert its effects so let us go to the classification of a tricyclic antidepressant you can basically divide it structurally into a tertiary amine as well as a secondary amine so i've already mentioned regarding this ring it has got three rings with a side chain and the side chain ends in n and n is connected if n is connected to two methyl group then it is called a tertiary amine like this like here 
But if n is connected only to one methyl group and the other part is H, okay, only one methyl group at the end of the side chain, then it's called a secondary amine. So imipramine is an example of a tertiary amine and desipramine is an example of a secondary amine. Other examples which come in tertiary amines are clomipramine, amitriptyline, doxapine, trimipramine. Okay. And uh, in secondary amines, desipramine, nortriptyline, protriptyline, maprotyline, amoxapine, all these are secondary amines. So why you should understand this is that there is some difference. In tertiary amine, tertiary amines are more potent in blocking the reuptake of serotonin. Whereas secondary amines are more potent in blocking the reuptake of norepinephrine. So this has to be borne in mind. And one more thing, tertiary amines have got more side effect when compared to secondary amines. So we can just go through the diagram here. Here what you see is, here, this is an axon which contains storage ves vesicles and inside the vesicle we have got norepinephrine and norepinephrine is released into the synapse. And finally, it's basically released into the synapse so that it goes and binds to the alpha receptors on the dendrite, on the dendritic membrane, the postsynaptic uh, uh, mem membrane of the de this thing, dendrite. And once this norepinephrine goes and attaches to the alpha receptors, it starts to ex it, it exerts its uh, action. But what happens here is there is some scarcity of norepinephrine in this synapse. Okay, and majority of these alpha receptors are not activated by these norepinephrine. So resultant thing is there is underactivation of alpha receptors. Okay, and if there is underactivation of alpha receptors, naturally, patient will have something called as retarded depression. Okay, so what will happen to the norepinephrine here once it, it exerts its, act, its action? It will finally go back to, to the presynaptic membrane and re, again re enter the vesicle, and the same process continues like that. Okay, here if you look at it, if, if you look at this diagram, we have got the axon here. Inside the vesicles, we have got a serotonin, also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine, the 5-HT. And that is also released into the uh, synapse. So that this 5-hydroxytryptamine, also known as serotonin, goes and binds to the 5-hydroxytryptamine receptors on the dendritic membrane. And so that it exerts its action. But in this particular condition, there is less amount of serotonin in this synapse and finally most of them are being taken back into the presynaptic membrane, into the vesicles and it, this keeps continuing. But this, these receptors are in the hope that these serotonin will come and bind to them, but nothing is happening. So what happens? There is underactivation of 5-hydroxytryptamine receptors and that leads to agitated depression. So the term retarded depression and agitated depression these are different variants of the term depression. Retarded depression, agitated depression, stupor, so many things are there. But uh, with regard to tricyclic antidepressants, this is the area where they act. Okay, so just understand that if a psychiatrist gives a tricyclic antidepressant to a patient with depression, it's basically to deal with retarded depression as well as to deal with the agitated depression. So in this case, the psychiatrist has given the drug and the drug finally gets absorbed your circulation and finally reaches the neuron, the synapse. And what happens is here, this reuptake of norepinephrine into the axon is blocked. And here what happens is the reuptake of serotonin, also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine, that is also blocked. So ultimately what happens is the amount of norepinephrine in the synapse increases, increases so much that it finally gets attached to the receptors. The underactivated alpha receptors get activated. Okay, so there is increased activation of alpha receptors and that leads to resolution of symptoms. Here also the same thing happens. The serotonin 
gets attached to the the serotonin is found in increased amounts in the synapse and finally it gets attached to the uh, serotonin receptors and that leads to resolution of symptoms that means decrease in agitated depression so when a psychiatrist gives a tricyclic antidepressant his main intention is to block the uptake of norepinephrine as well as to block the reuptake of serotonin so again this is also almost a similar diagram here is also a uh, axon these are all three axons and this is a dendrite but what you can see here is that apart from blocking the 5 hydroxy tryptamine or the serotonin reuptake transporter and the noradrenaline reuptake transporter this particular tricyclic antidepressant is also acting on some other agents some other receptors the histamine receptor the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor and certain other receptors also thereby it is producing unwanted effects so so how it produces unwanted effects this is this chart depicts how it produces unwanted effects so in total there are basically 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 7 mechanisms of tricyclic antidepressant toxicity okay so if the tricyclic antidepressant goes and blocks the post synaptic histamine receptor it leads to sedation depressed consciousness delirium whereas if the tricyclic antidepressant goes and binds to the post synaptic muscarinic m1 receptor and causes blockade then it produces an anticholinergic effect almost similar to atropine okay and if there is a if you look at the central uh, system we will find that patient will have agitation delirium confusion amnesia hallucination slurred speech ataxia sedation all these things and peripherally if you look at it patient will have dilated pupils blurred vision tachycardia hyperthermia hypertension decreased secretions dry skin ileus urinary retention just like atropine how atropine toxicity presents almost similar way the patient will present and if the tca binds to a post synaptic alpha adrenergic receptor and causes blockade okay should should understand that there are two receptors alpha 1 and alpha 2 but in case of tca the alpha 1 blockade is much more than that of alpha 2 so if alpha 1 is blocked patient will have sedation meiosis orthostatic hypotension reflex tachycardia and if alpha 2 is blocked patient will have mild hypertension okay next comes blockade of gaba a receptor if gaba a receptor is blocked patient will have an episode of seizure okay and what if the cardiac fast sodium channel is blocked especially in the uh, bundle of his Pur purkinje myocardium and all okay and that will lead to conduction abnormalities what happens here is basically an inhibition of the sodium influx through the voltage dependent sodium channel during the phase 0 of depolarization okay and that will lead to decrease in conduction velocity increase in the duration of the repolarization and also the absolute refractory period so this is what causes conduction abnormalities this one what if the tca causes potassium channel blockage that will lead to qt prolongation so a block blockade of myocardial potassium channels resulting in decrease in potassium efflux during repolarization causes qt prolongation and this is almost we know we this is a like what we expect like if you are planning to treat a patient with tca this is what we expect inhibition of amines reuptake and inhibition of norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake and if norepinephrine is inhibited patient will have the early sympathomimetic effects plus or minus cardiac arrhythmias if in case of serotonin will have hyperreflexia myoclonus okay so if tca acts on only these two sites patient will have therapeutic uh if, if tca is given at in given in therapeutic doses and patient uh, normally uh, the drug will act only on this site this receptor 
whereas if as the tci has got a very narrow therapeutic index there are chances that it may also act on other receptors such as postsynaptic histamine receptor blockade postsynaptic muscarinic m1 receptor postsynaptic alpha adrenergic receptor gaba a receptor cardiac fast sodium channels potassium channels all these things so based on which receptor is being blocked patient will have that corresponding clinical effects the clinical features so to understand in detail what exactly these these receptors mean uh, i would advise you to please go and revise your uh, chapter on receptors especially in physiology then you will have a better understanding of how these things are happening okay so moving on to toxicity generally speaking uh, if the consumption of tc is less than 1 mg per kg it is generally non toxic but if the consumption is more than 10 mg per kg that may cause life threatening symptoms and more than 1 gram is definitely fatal the onset of symptoms of tca toxicity generally start within 2 hours and children are more susceptible to anti muscarinic effects and also in patients with, uh, having pre existing heart or neurological disease the propensity of for uh, tca toxicity is very much higher one word regarding the desipramine desipramine is a very the most potent sodium channel blocker among the tcas and it will precipitate cardiotoxicity because of that but will not produce any anti muscarinic symptom desipramine and one peculiarity regarding Um, aprotilin is it, it will cause seizure if the patient has consumed amoxapin you should know that it is the only antidepressant with antipsychotic effect and that will produce seizure but with normal qrs so in uh, if you look at the normal therapeutic levels for tc it is around 75 to 300 nanograms per ml if you consider both the uh, parents tca as well as the uh metabolite the 75 to 300 nanograms per ml and if that that level is more than 1000 nanograms per ml that will increase the risk for seizure as well as cardiotoxicity and another thing is the clinical toxicity does not correlate with plasma tca levels so how do you diagnose diagnosis is basically purely based on a history of exposure to tca a proper clinical symptomatology signs and symptoms which fits into a tca uh, toxicity and also the ecg findings ecg finding is very important and if possible if you if you, if you really suspect a tca toxicity you can actually send a urine drug screen for tca but at times what happens is it can be for false positive in patients of consumed carbamazepine cetirizine diphenhydramine Cetiapin, phenothiazine, and all these things. But if you are planning to send serum TCA, usually that does not help to guide therapy because, as, as I've already mentioned, TCA is very much uh, lipid soluble, and it won't stay in your blood circulation for uh, long enough. So taking a blood sample may not uh, help you in any way. Moving on to the clinical features, you can basically can divide it into. mild tca poisoning moderate tca poisoning severe tca poisoning severe tca poisoning comprises of basically neurological toxicity as well as cardiac toxicity neurological toxicity basically uh, happens if if the qrs duration is more than 100 milliseconds whereas cardiac toxicity happens if qrs is more than 160 milliseconds and patient may have uh, seizures coma status epilepticus all these things and for cardiac toxicity patient will have svp conduction delays hypotension ventricular premature complexes ventricular tachycardias and all these things and also respiratory depression in case of mild and mild tca to toxicity or moderate tca to toxicity the most common symptom with which the patient presents is basically altered level of consciousness especially drowsiness confusion then at times patient can have slurred speech ataxia hyperreflexia and i have already mentioned anti muscarinic uh, signs dry mucous membranes ileus urinary retention 
and sinus tachycardia mild hypertension all these things can happen but only if the patient is having this neurotoxicity or cardiotoxicity we will label them as a severe tca toxicity so moving on to what are the ecg findings uh, abnormalities you'll get it but not in the first 6 hours it may not usually may not be present okay after you consume if i consume tca uh, in the first six hours, you may not really find anything wrong in the ECG, but afterwards you may find uh, ECG abnormalities. And if ECG abnormality is present, and if you give the antidote, uh, normally immediately it may, he, he may not recover. Usually ECG changes uh, resolve over around 36 to 48 hours. So look for the characteristic findings. So this you'll, you'll have to understand. Uh, normally it will be asked for exams. Sinus tachycardia, as we all know, it's due to muscarinic cholinergic stimulation. Sinus tachycardia, all of us know, just like atropine. Increased PR interval. QR of duration more than 100 milliseconds. This happens basically because of sodium channel blockade. Okay. And then in AVR lead, we'll have a terminal right axis deviation for the, la the last 40 milliseconds. AVR lead. And also... You shall have to look for a positive terminal QRS deflection. R wave will be more than 3 mm or R by S in AVR lead will be greater than or equal to 0.7. And in one and AVL, you may get a deep S wave. At times, you'll have a you'll get to see something like the, the Burgada pattern with RBBB and ST elevation and V1 to V3. That's because of uh, sodium channel blockade. And uh, if potassium channel is blocked, you may have increased QT prolongation. And at times, your patient may also have AV block. So all these various kinds of bizarre QRS, uh, bizarre ECG conduction abnormalities will happen in tricyclic acute stress. This is an ECG. You can just correlate, which I've already mentioned, you can just go through the ECG here. So how do you manage a tricyclic antidepressant toxicity? Just like any other case, any other tox toxicity, any other case, em like in emergency department, always deal with the airway breathing circulation, ABCs, place an IV line, cardiac monitoring, serial ECGs, labs. And if the patient has consumed like uh, co-ingestants such as acetaminophen or salicylate, you can send that also. In ABG, if the patient is symptomatic, basically to determine the pH, and as you know, the, the patient has if, will have mascarinic symptoms, you, which involves urinary retention and ileus. And for that, you'll have to place a Foley's and an NG tube. And monitor the patient for six hours. And you can also do a gastrointestinal decontamination, but not with a gastric lavage or a Ipecac syrup. You can just give an activated charcoal, one gram per kg. That may be effective. If given within two hours of ingestion, that's what up to date says. Previously, we used to uh, advocate the use of multi dose activated charcoal and whole, whole bowel irrigation, but nowadays, an up to date doesn't uh, give it as a recommendation. But the most important thing is this soda bicarb therapy, soda bicarb. So, but, but these are the various indications for giving a soda bicarb in a case of tricyclic antidepressant toxicity. If the QRS is more than 100 milliseconds, if there is terminal right axis deviation more than 120 degrees, for refractory hypotension, for ventricular dysrhythmias, all these things, you can start soda bicarb. And the dose is 1 to 2 milli equivalents per kg bolus. And that has to be repeated until patient shows improvement. Always assess the QRS, narrowing of the QRS. And another endpoint that the up-to-date mentions is if the pH is between 7.5 to the blood pH, serum pH between 7.5 to 7.55, then you can stop giving uh, this thing, soda bicarb. Another way to give is uh, as an infusion, 150 milli equivalents of soda bicarb in one liter of 5% dextrose at 2 to 3 ml per kg per hour. Here also the endpoint is if, if the pH is between 7.5 to 7.55. Okay. 
So naturally, uh, as all of us know, if soda bicarb is given, that will decrease the potassium level. Hence, you have to, you'll have to give IV KCL correction also. So ABCs, all routines, GI decontamination, activated charcoal, soda bicarb for these, if the patient has got these uh, uh, ECG abnormalities, dose is this one. And if the patient has got altered level of consciousness, treatment is basically reassurance plus benzodiazepine. Always for me, uh, remember that no flumazenil should be given for mixed TCA plus benzodiazepine overdoses and no phytostigmine for TCA plus anticholinergic overdoses. If the patient threw, uh, throws a seizure or something, you can treat it with a benzodiazepine such as diazepam, lorazepam, midazolam, something of that sort. And if you terminate the seizure, but uh, if the seizure is still persisting and if it is still resistant, you can try with a phenobarbital 10 to 15 mg per kg. One thing that has to be borne in mind is that do not treat with phenytoin as it acts on sodium channel and also acts on GABA A receptors. Okay, so never treat with phenytoin. And if the, if the patient is not able to maintain his airway, naturally you'll have to do an intubation, like just like any other case. And uh, EEG monitoring can be done if patient is continuously throwing seizures. And the hypo hypotension management, you'll have to manage it in the C, A, B, C, C part itself with isotonic crystalloids, 10 to 30 ml per kg, and also epinephrine and norepinephrine. If uh, BP is not picking up, uh, DOPA is generally not advised. Okay. Uh, this norepinephrine and epinephrine basically act uh, directly compete with TCA, the alpha adrenergic receptors. And if still BP is low, you can actually go ahead with mechanical support of circulation with cardiopulmonary bypass, overdrive pacing, IABP for refractory hyper hypotension. And this is one important thing. If the patient uh, has, has got some cardiac conduction abnormality, avoid these drugs. Class 1A antiarrhythmic agents, 1C and antiarrhythmic agents, class 3 antiarrhythmic agents, beta blockers, CCB, because this is what we generally tend to give for almost all uh, arrhythmias. So avoid, if, if, if you have got a clue that the patient is having these cardiac abnormalities because of TCA, avoid these drugs. And in case of Tursadas, MGSO for 2 grams IV as usual. And in case of ventricular arrhythmias, 3% hypertonic saline, 1 to 3 ml per kg over 10 minutes. And liquid emulsion is also being suggested. So these are the basic treatment. Always treat the uh, cardio uh, treat the uh, cardio cardiotoxicity as well as the neurotoxicity with appropriate soda bicarb or e benzodiazepines or whatever. And uh, make sure that you don't give phenytoin or even these uh, antiarrhythmic uh, drugs belonging to class one A, one C, class three uh, beta blockers, CCBs. Okay, hope you all have understood what I've said so far. Now, how do you discharge the patient? If the patient is admitted after TCA consumption, but the patient is asymptomatic even after six hours, Dr. Day says that patient can be safely discharged. But if the patient is symptomatic, any symptoms which I've already mentioned, if the patient has got some symptom, then it's better to admit in a monitored bed. And if the patient has got some moderate to severe TCA toxicity features, then you'll have to admit in an ICU. And when to discharge an already admitted uh, patient? So if the patient is completely asymptomatic and if ECG is normal and if mental status is completely normal and all antimascarinic symptoms are completely gone, completely, it's, it's com there, is, there is complete resolution of all these symptoms, then patient can be safely discharged. And that too, if the after a proper psychiatric consultation, if this uh, was a suicidal attempt, if the TC has been cons uh, consumed uh, for in, uh, uh, with the intention of suicide, you'll have to give a psychiatric consultation also. So this is all about tricyclic antidepressant toxicity. Hope all of you have understood what I've whatever I've said so far. Thank you.